Hello everyone and welcome to um, to Scott's session on, uh, do I call it a, a accommodating competence-based assessment or do I call it why the gradebook is broken? I'm not sure. We'll let Scott explain. So um, I want to start by thanking you very much for uh, taking the time out to present and, um, and without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is a repeat from the one that I did last night, so you'll have to forgive me. Sometimes the repeat sessions, they can either... I, I teach two, sec two uh, classes back-to-back, -back, and I find that the afternoon one always tends to go faster. So um, if I'm going fast or something, please let me know. We'll see how the morning does. Also, it's, it's uh, 8 o'clock in the morning for me, and I'm a little bit tired, but we'll do our best. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I'm a teacher here in Australia, and I teach at a TAFE, which uh, some people know what that is, but it's, I guess, the the closest equivalent, you could say, to um, a technical school, a, um, a trade school, or a community college, maybe one of those sort of things. Uh, I teach uh, IT. I teach web design, so HTML, CSS. I also teach... Um, CMS customization, we use WordPress for that. So I'm a little bit of a, a an odd duck in that I, I'm a fan of WordPress and I'm a fan of Moodle and I'm, I jump between the two communities. I, I love both these communities. Um, anyway, so at TAFE, we, let me just see, I've got a little bit of glare there. At TAFE, we actually work inside a uh, system where we, when we give people marks, we actually give them a competency-based mark. And just a, a little bit of a background, we call this uh, this sector here in Australia the VET sector, so vocational education training. And the VET sector in Australia is actually um, it's governed by this uh, group called ASQA, the Australian Skills Quality Authority. And and the point of ASQA is that a TAFE here in Sydney will actually be teaching students the same content as a TAFE in say Perth. So it's it's kind of like a national system, a national framework, so that everybody is taught the same skills. Um, so a, a diploma of IT and web design here is exactly the same as a diploma of IT and web design at another school, in theory. Uh, so any any training provider, whether it's TAFE, a government body, or if it's a actual private uh, training provider, they're all they all have to be registered training organizations. And uh, to deliver accredited training in the vet sector in Australia, you have to be an RTO. So that's kind of the background of what we're dealing with. And uh, just as a teacher, I don't I don't deal with this sort of paperwork that often. But um, in dealing with like my head teachers who have to maintain this a little bit better, we have been audited in the past. And auditing is not a bad thing. Uh, everybody gets audited from time to time. And um, we actually passed our audit, no problems, but we did have a few areas of improvement that they, they identified. Some of them were all about, well, most of them were about actually documenting the evidence and um, justifying the outcome we gave. We had, uh, we keep facing the question of why did you determine this person to be competent? Why is a competent a competent? And also we had some problems with some feedback for students. So, um, one of the uh, and one of the other areas that we were kind of focused on and, and for improvement is this idea of a student assessment guide. So every student that we have at the beginning of the year, we have to give them a student assessment guide that says how they'll be assessed and when when the assessments will take place and uh, that sort of information, that vital information that a student needs in order to do well. So we have a standard standardized document, a template. And uh, we just fill in the details for this particular course. And actually, we do it at the unit level. So uh, what I mean by that is in, say, a diploma of web design, one of the units will be on HTML, uh, create a markup language, for instance. And so that's an actual unit. But that's not the entire course. It's just a particular unit in the course. Uh, so one of the things was we uh, we had to provide better evidence that students were getting this student assessment guide. And this is something that we figured we could actually keep track of inside Moodle. So we started to 
my colleagues and myself, we started to actually build a few courses in Moodle, and we called them proof of concept courses. And uh, we wanted to incorporate as many of these ideas that we had for feedback into this sort of development Moodle to test out these ideas, see if they would work, and uh, just kind of tease it all out. So um, Sharon and I actually built this course, the database course, because we were both teachers on the database units. And we kind of took it and uh, put in as much of the feedback that we got, tried to accommodate it as much as possible. So this is, yeah, this is the start of the course here. And uh, you can tell it's a development one because it doesn't look very pretty. We just uh, put in <laughs> some placeholder images and so forth. Um, but one of the things that we actually incorporated and that's been very successful is we actually have this section here, Do the, does the student accept the SAG? So I think I skipped the part where the SAG is actually a PDF here. They download the PDF and this is actually a choice. So we're actually taking Moodle's choice element, putting it in there, and the students have to acknowledge, yes, I have read the SAG, and uh, by using activity, uh, what's that, completion tracking, we could actually then make it so that nothing else in the class was actually able to be accessed by the student until they had acknowledged that they accepted the SAG which is what we were technically allowed, was supposed to do. We're not allowed to let the students start the course until they have actually received this paperwork and they acknowledge they've received this paperwork. So just by tapping into Moodle, some of the things that are already built in, we were able to uh, achieve some of the um, goals we were looking at in the proof of concept course. Of course, we did have the question of, what if a student says, no, they didn't accept the SAG? And we thought about it, what does that mean? What, is, what do we do with that? And we decided along the way, we just wanted to make a choice with just one element. Yes, I accept the SAG. And if they don't accept it, well, fine. You, you can't do anything in the course. So um, it's kind of odd that we have a choice and you only have one choice. Anyway, um, if I want to, if I can pivot now, I'm going to dive deeper into this idea of competency-based training and assessment. And I wanted to just kind of, um, sort of preface this with, I have a teacher's understanding of this, uh, and I'm by no means an expert in this field of this actual definition of competency-based training and assessment. I can talk about what it means to me, but in the big grand scheme of things, maybe there's going to be different definitions out there. So for us, we this is the official definition from ASPA. Competency-based training and assessment means that a person is trained and assessed to meet the performance and knowledge requirements to safely and effectively complete workplace activities in a range of different situations and environments to an industry standard that's expected in the workplace. So if you're competent, you can perform this, this, uh, this, required, this requirement to a industry standard. And it's kind of an odd way of, of uh, thinking about Mark, but it kind of makes sense in our industry, in the vet sector, in that we're not measuring how well they do it, we're measuring that they can do it. And we've got very set black and white. Either you can do this, and not just uh, you can repeat, repeatedly do this competently, or you can't. And uh, we, we define that as competent, not yet competent. We don't want to ever say somebody is incompetent. We don't ever want to say that somebody is uh, not competent. We want to say they're not yet competent. They haven't achieved this skill yet. We don't want to say that uh, they can't, just that they haven't yet. So it's very that's a very um, interesting distinction, I guess. One of the things that competency-based uh, training for us is not is it does not compare the training outcomes between learners. Learners are assessed against the requirements of a training product. So this idea of, uh, well, I guess we've all been there in traditional marking schemes. Maybe the teacher marks on the bell curve. That we had to get rid of entirely. We wanted to not compare the students, not rank the students in any way. And as part of that, we actually got rid of, well, we didn't. This is what we've been told to do. The students won't actually receive a mark. They receive either a competent or a not yet competent. 
So it's a very interesting way of, of marking. It's really kind of thrown our heads for a loop because all of us were trained in a in a world where we got marks. We got either letters, A's, B's, and C's, A pluses, um, F's occasionally, uh, or we either received that or we actually received a percentage. You know, you got a 95%. And that's what people understand. They understand the percentages. It's it's more difficult to explain to them that they're they're getting a a competent as opposed to an actual mark. So uh, what makes a student competent in a unit of study? And this has led to a lot of discussions around the classroom. We've had a lot of mark material developed for us, you know, in the form of tests. And so the question becomes like, if we have a typical multi-choice, multiple choice test, what does a student have to achieve on the test to be competent? Is it 50%? Because 50% is what's always been ingrained to us as that's a pass mark, 50%. That doesn't seem like competent. If I had an airline pilot flying the plane and he only knew 50% of the task, I don't think that would be a good flight. Likewise, if there was a doctor doing an operation on me, he only knew 50%, not a good day for me. Is it 70%? We, bet, we tossed around these figures. Maybe it's 70, maybe it's 80. We kind of felt maybe like the numbers inside there. But even then, is that competent? Is it 100%? So it's led to a lot of discussion and a lot of soul searching amongst us as to how many questions do you have to get right and which questions do you have to get right? It's, it's a kind of a tricky question. And I think that different people answer that different ways. Um, we've kind of answered it by trying to get rid of tests like that, a multiple choice test. We've kind of said in these occasions, it's not really testing the competency. So uh, we've also had a problem with our students um, trying to understand the system. They come from, say, the majority of our students at this college, they come straight out of high school. And so they're used to this idea of marks and they get a percentage. So they're getting, let's say, a, on, a, on a test, they get a 55 out of 100, and then they'd say, well, I, I passed, right? And you look at the actual questions, and maybe there's an entire set of performance criteria that they got all the questions wrong. And trying to explain to the student, look, you might think that this is a pass, but it's not a pass because you, you failed the, some of the key questions. Uh, we also had a, a few problems with some students who perhaps they've done really well on one assessment and uh, maybe they've got three projects. For me, I, I do a lot of projects because it's web design, so you're obviously building web, building web. A student did really well on the first project and then they just didn't bother to do the second project. They were like, well, you know, I did super well, so I figured that was enough to pass me. And trying to explain to a student, it does not work that way. There's no waiting. There's no... This one was worth 40%. This one's worth 70% or well, 40 and 70 doesn't add up. But um, there is no weighting system. The, each of the assessments have to be passed. They're all must pass. And so we've had a lot of problems with even trying to get this idea across to our students. So inside Moodle, uh, in particular, I found that trying to build this proof of concept course we came across some problems where Moodle was broken. So how is Moodle broken? Well, maybe it's not. Uh, I'm not entirely sure yet. And here's the reason why. Because um, on Monday, uh, 3.1 arrived, as you all know. And inside Monday, uh, inside Monday's 3.1, um, I was, uh, just before I went to bed, I checked my email. And uh, of course, I got the, uh, email from Moodle saying uh, new videos have been uploaded to the YouTube channel. So I went to check it out really quick. And yeah, I'm looking at the new Moodle YouTube channel and I was like, okay, yeah, all kinds of stuff about how to use 3.1. And then something caught my eye. This one right here, CE for admins. What is that? Competency-based education for administrators. Competency-based education for teachers. Competency-based education for students. And of course, my heart just sunk because I knew I had this presentation. So Moodle, you have destroyed me by answering all my prayers. 
So obviously, I've made one too many Martin Dugiamis jokes. I'm very sorry, Martin, for all the jokes. Um, obviously, you have targeted me with this uh, release just before the presentation. Um, actually, I do have a selfie with Martin, and he's actually happy here, so I don't think it was actually very personal. Um, so, in fact, in preparation for this on Wednesday, I believe, I actually sat down, watched the, ex watched the videos, and I'm actually really pleased by what I saw. Now, each of the videos is, you know, three minutes long at the most. What I saw in the little teaser, it looks very promising. I'm very excited. I want to get down, install 3.1, test it out, play with it, see if it is going to be kind of the answer, the magic bullet to, to a lot of our, um, our problems. Uh, but what if you don't have 3.1? And I'm guessing nobody here has installed 3.1. Uh, I haven't really been reading the comments. I saw a lot of people have been commenting, but is, has anybody, just a hands up or a comment, has anybody actually, uh, somebody has installed 3.1. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Gareth, you are you are um, cutting edge. That's amazing. For development purposes, yes. Um, <laughs> so uh, in our situation, for production Moodle, actually we have a few. One is so old that I didn't even want to put up the number there. Five. Um, but uh, that one's actually being retired. And the production with Moodle that we're moving to, uh, it's quite old. It's 2.7, but it's actually going to be updated uh, during the during the winter break here. And I think it's going to be upgraded to three. Um, I don't know. That's not really up to up to me. I I would have. Uh, anyway, uh, my development Moodle that I work on, that I test a lot of these ideas, I I have to admit, even that is pretty old. It's 2.9, so it's a year old. And um, I'll probably be downloading and uh, putting up 3.1 shortly, um, by chance. Uh, so anyway, the issues that I'm talking about in this presentation actually relate to these older versions. Uh, you're still on 2.4. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's crazy. Sorry, I, something distracted me in the chat. Somebody's running Moodle 2.4. No, no, you're on 2.9 now. Okay. Up to two weeks ago, you were on 2.4. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. Um, well, yeah, we'll have to trade war stores later. All right. So um, getting back to our actual course, and I've got a a collection of screenshots here, some from uh, a actual production Moodle that we're actually developing one of our products in, and one from uh, a few from the, the the actual development Moodle where I tease out ideas. So this is from a course that we're developing for for solely online delivery. Uh, it's a networking course, and it's kind of interesting because the person who is developing it with me, neither of us are networking teachers. So sometimes we actually have to go back to the uh, subject matter experts because we're both lost in the actual material. But um, these are this is essentially a student marking guide. So we've actually translated that and put that up online. So just to give the students an idea of what they have to achieve inside this assessment. And so this is an assessment, but it's actually made up of three activities. Uh, we call them tasks. And uh, you can see inside here, it's a little bit hard to read. But, uh, the idea is that um, in the first task, they have to get six out of the seven questions answered correctly. And six of the seven was kind of the one of those, like I was talking about, is that enough for competency? And we went back and forth with that. And that's the number we settled on for this one. Um, but you can see that we've actually got inside here, students can achieve a result in these tasks of either it's satisfactory or not satisfactory. So at this level, at the assessment level, uh, we have to mark students as either satisfactory or not satisfactory. And um, because at a competent, the word competent implies they're competent for the entire unit. So we've been told for our, for our assessments to use the word satisfactory or not satisfactory. So the idea would be that if you have all your assessments marked as satisfactory, then you have achieved a competency. Um, and inside there, actually, if we have these sort of sub-assessments, so you can see task one, task two, each of these has to be a satisfactory. So that's kind of the, the idea of the marking guide that we've come up with. 
Um, and you can see also, this is again, what I was talking about, the student assessment guide. They're not actually able to submit work to this assessment until they've actually acknowledged that uh, they have, actually in this case, it's that they don't get it until they acknowledge that this is not plagiarism, uh, but it's also the same function as um, student assessment guide. They can't do anything until they acknowledge that they have accepted the student assessment guide and also that they acknowledge that this is their own work and so forth. And I can't remember why I put in this slide, so we're just gonna skip that one. Um, so if we actually take a look inside the, the actual assessment itself uh, in some of the setups, we, we've been using a, uh, an outcome scale, or sorry, a, some outcomes of uh, competency-based. So we played around a bit with this, these ideas of how we're gonna mark them. And we've come up with a few ideas of scales where satisfactory, not satisfactory. Um, and we've also taken into account these outcomes. So in digging around, playing with this proof of concept, I came across outcomes and I thought, this is a fantastic, idea using outcomes. So in fact, we actually listed uh, all the different performance criteria inside the unit and put those in as outcomes. And the idea was if we could attach each of those performance criteria to the assessment that we're testing those performance criteria, we could actually document, okay, the student has achieved satisfactory result in this performance criteria, and this one, and this one, and this one. And we also did it, uh, we played around with doing it on the unit level. so as the overall course, we said, okay, the student has achieved competency in this unit. So in playing with all this, we thought this was a great idea, but in working with it, um, yeah, and this is an attempt to match outcomes with the performance criteria with the units and the ASCO units. In playing with though, one of the problems was uh, there was just way too many outcomes. And we found that it was actually causing way too much confusion and not giving us any clarity at all. So it was not a good route to go down. Uh, I was very excited when I first found outcomes, but I've found it's, it doesn't act the way that I thought it would. And it's actually added more confusion to, to the process rather than any kind of clarity. Uh, at first I thought this was a great thing. This is a way that we could actually attach those performance criteria to assessments. But it, has anybody played with outcomes in that you find that now you have an item inside the grade book, but it's not, it doesn't work the way you think it would be. It's not like if you get a satisfactory in these assessment, in these tasks, the outcome becomes a yes, a check mark, which is, is what we were looking for. So, if we actually dig into the actual assessment, and I believe this is a similar assessment to the, the one I was demonstrating before. Um, in playing with it, part of the problem was, let's say task one, it has seven questions to answer. Automatically, the default comes up with, it's a, it's a mark out of seven, which makes sense, I suppose. But for us, it, it kind of becomes a problem with, we don't want these to ever be marks. We, we wanted to get away from marks entirely. And certainly, we didn't want to have an end result where we're trying to do a weight out of a 100%. So we looked into, is there a way that we could actually use the weighting to try to give us a scale that, that somehow made sense? And I have to tell you, I've played with this screen for hours, doing different math formulas, different aggregates, different something that would actually add up the way that we wanted. We wanted it so that each of these well, um, it becomes something that the student has to achieve entirely 100%. Uh, so I've kind of identified it as this way. We need logical math. So coming from a computer science sort of programming background, I'm looking at it like we need to be able to use logical operators inside the gradebook. Uh, but the gradebook is based upon the idea that, you know, assessment one's worth 25%, assessment two is worth 40%, assessment three is worth with 35% and overall it adds up to 100. And really we need more something more like assessment one must be competent or must be a satisfactory result. Assessment two must be a satisfactory result. Assessment three must be a satisfactory result. Overall, you achieve competency then. So we almost need like a, a logical ands or even a logical or. So we could have like assessment one, 
must be satisfactory or assessment one reset must be satisfactory. So that's the big problem that we've come across. Um, we have two solutions for how to fix this. And there's probably other solutions out there, but these are the two that we've identified and we've we've tried to use. Um, number one, uh, one of my colleagues, this is her solution. She uh, she went in and you can edit the letter grades. So inside Moodle, there's letter grades, A, B, C, uh, D, and F maybe. And you can actually reset the boundaries. So she said, no problem. I'll rename A to satisfactory and I'll set the boundary to be 100% and the lowest 100%. Everything else is not satisfactory. So that way, it doesn't really matter when you put your tests together, when you put your assignments together, all the weighting, all the marking doesn't really matter that much uh, because it's going to automatically calculate for us whether they're satisfactory or not satisfactory. That's her way of doing it. Uh, my way of doing it was I went in and I looked at one of the marking schemes, the rubric, and I said, okay, here's the rubric. Let's actually play with this a little bit. Let's modify it. So traditionally, a rubric, you have maybe a, a number of different levels that I hear. Student did this well, or student did this poorly, student did this adequately, student did this well, or something like that. And you could give them different points. So one's worth zero, one's worth one, one's worth two, and so forth. I went in and I said, okay, why don't we make one column all not satisfactory? one column all satisfactory. Now you can hide these points from the student. So I said, why don't we just give both of them zero points? And then at the very end, the teacher determines the overall result, either not satisfactory worth zero or satisfactory worth one point. So down at the very end, that's where the teacher actually determines, okay, this was an overall satisfactory uh, assessment and the student the teacher could actually learn marking or even the marker because we're moving to a model where the markers not, might not be the teachers the markers would look up the up the table and they could see okay this was the one 1 1.2 investigate current organizational copyright policy they achieved a not satisfactory there and in fact we could actually give feedback as to why the student missed that part which options better well in my own personal opinion, uh, I think option two is better because the students are never actually given a grade. Okay, they are given either a zero or a one. I view that as either a true or a false. Um, but option one is the one that we're actually using in the production, mainly because it's less work. Part of the problem with this this uh, the version that I've done, the option two, is that um, in the end, it really it comes down to the teacher having that one extra line in there that they have to mark. and um, it's it kind of I don't know. People said that this option one seemed to work better. We tested it a few times with this few students, and uh, we've gone with this one. And um, that's the that's the the rationale for that. Anyway, so that's our way of dealing with the problems inside the gradebook. I've heard a couple other people in last night's session um, talk about some of the ideas that they've had about using scales, putting in some custom scales that seemed to work. Um, and uh, at this point in time, I believe the time is now, I think I'm near that, yeah, I'm one minute off. Uh, so I'm going to throw it open to questions and discussion. So I saw that there was a huge amount of discussion here. I, I had to turn myself away from actually reading it, um, but uh, some fantastic online discussion here anyway. Uh, so let's actually start in here. Does the, the word satisfactory is traditional, the middle ground. How do you rate things like to praise achievement with excellent and so forth? This is one of the hard things. That's a great question. This is one of the hard things with the with this um, this way of doing it. Uh, if we actually look at the, I can answer that entirely. Um, where is it? Let me move to a slide here. Just give me a second. Uh, it's this slide right here. Um, Competency is we do not compare the training outcomes between the learners. Uh, learners are assessed against the requirements of a training product. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Sometimes you have a student who's done a fantastic job, and sometimes you've done a student who's done uh, like an adequate job. Exactly what you're talking about, the, the middle ground. They've been able to demonstrate that they've, they've done this. Maybe not done this like amazing, but they've they've done this, 
And it's because we can't compare students. Is it in this question? No, it's in this slide. We're not, we're not comparing training outcomes between the learners. So that entire idea that a student has done this excellently, excellently is almost like a comparison. We're only assessing the students if they've achieved a competent result or not, uh, or a satisfactory result or not in that, if you're talking about an actual assessment. It's a very weird way of doing it because you're exactly right. They, they don't get that different levels. So some students do fantastic work, some students do okay work, and they both achieve the same result. And for students, they find that frustrating. Sometimes as a teacher, I find that frustrating. But if you think about it in terms of VET and who we're actually, uh, the types of students we're traditionally trying to train, I mean, um, at, at this college, we're also training like uh, chippies, um, uh, carpenters, and we're also training uh, plumbing. And those for, for those those people, that sort of importance of uh, that uh, fantastic achievement is is a little bit less important. We're just trying to train people who are able to do the job as opposed to fantastic artisans. Um, I wish there was a better answer to that, Gareth, because I, I'm kind of with you in that I wish I could actually praise students who've done a good job. Um, and, and all I can do is, is tell students, yeah, you've done a great job, but it doesn't actually reflect in the mark. Uh, uh, with forecasters, okay, I, I saw that um, Gareth has actually uh, a reply. I'll come back to that in a second. I'm going to answer Michelle's here, or read Michelle's. So with forecasters, we added a feedback area where we could suggest that the forecasters were good candidates for things like advanced forecasting courses and so forth. So excellent is not assessed, but they get the reward as well. That's great. That's a great answer. Yeah. So you've actually built into the process. Um, still within this competency-based education, a way that actually you could praise uh, uh, students. That's yeah, that's great feedback. Um, I'll have to think about how we're going to implement something like that. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a great idea. Uh, trying to come up with a way that we can actually tell a student that they've done a, a great job, and and maybe that's part of the thing where we're actually saying that they're good candidates for further courses. Um, in the world of recruiting a group of candidates, we'll all be able to undertake the position, but you need a way, means of differentiating them. Uh, this is very true, but I suppose that's somebody else's job, not necessarily mine. Uh, you're, yeah, you're right. And, and the truth is, you know, I you always want to hire the best people. And um, I guess the powers that be have determined that the way that we are to mark students is not to actually compare them to each other. We are to mark them whether they're, uh, they've they achieved this assessment, or this uh, performance criteria or not. Uh, great feedback, though. That's uh, some some great idea there. And and I, I appreciate the, um, look, it's taken us a long time to get our heads around uh, competency-based education. And uh, at times, we still fall back to the whole trap of we want to give students marks. You know, especially like uh, because Moodle makes a multiple choice test is so easy to do in Moodle. And then it becomes a question of, OK, you've built a great multiple choice test and it's it's marking itself. It's cut down on your marking. But what does it mean? At what point in time can you say the student is competent? So it's it, we've struggled a lot with that because we're trying to have our cake and eat it, too. We want the <laughs> we want that self marking uh, test. <laughs> but. But it, it, it leads to the question of what's the pass mark? Uh, all right. Um, yeah. Uh, any Anybody else? And the patient lives. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm going to scroll up a bit because I saw that there was a lot of chatter earlier, but I wasn't able to actually read it at the time. Um, I think that, uh, let me see here. I saw this this big quote here from Miriam. I just wanted to get a chance to read this. Um, we have some competency-based assessments that are actually completed by the assessor where the grade met or not met on the list of skills. Uh, then there's other assessments done by the SSE where they have to get 100 on the calculations test and 80 on the other test test. 
it's interesting to try to match up competency with percentage. Yes. So it sounds like you've you've had the same struggles at your at your institute of of making that um what is a what is a pass mark. Um, did somebody have a question on the audio? Somebody, I, I thought I heard somebody's microphone come on for a second. Oh, that was just me, Scott. Sorry, I was oh, just gonna, okay. I was just gonna jump in and say while people are thinking of questions, um, I'd really just again like to thank you very much for taking the time out to present this. Um, really fascinating, and I really think that um, once we can have a wee look at this three point one, you never know, we might, we might have. Um, a little luck with that so you know folks continue to ask questions um, if you've got a microphone feel free to pop your microphone on if you like um, or just continue to use the chat so we've still got you know we've got 25 minutes before the next session so there's still time for questions but um, again Scott thank you very much oh thank you very much uh, it's great audience I love to see a lot of the participation and uh, it's great that um, it's great that a lot of people actually have these issues themselves and have come across these issues themselves. I love talking about the different ways that um, uh, other people have solved the problems that we've come across as well. So please uh, feel free to even drop me a line. Uh, drop me. A, I'm always on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter. So um, I believe my. I'll just put my hand right here, uh, just at KS Huntley. Um, so if you ever want to, you know, follow me, tweet to me if you have a question or something like that. That's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. Um, but yeah, I like to hear how other people have, have come across or have solved these problems as well. Um, yes, uh, eighty percent. So eighty percent is eighty percent a competent, and uh, definitely I've come across this a few times. Uh, a lot of people in medical education have this issue of. of Apparently, competency-based education is very common in, in the medical field, and uh, yeah, the pass mark there is like a hundred percent because you don't want a doctor who who's an eighty percent student. You you want the hundred percent. Uh, certainly, I do if I'm doing, going into an operation, and um, it, it's a really tricky thing. Uh, I think that it's kind of come across the idea is is eighty percent a pass. Um, we've almost gone down to the question level, drilled down, and that's one of the reasons why we were so interested in, in outcomes. We wanted to drill down to the question level, and we wanted to see how the students did on those questions. So if we could attach competency to a question, and specifically we were talking about the database unit, we wanted to see, you know, we had these performance criteria, can the student do this inside my SQL? And, and it was very specific inside the, uh, the ASQA unit. Can the student do this in MySQL? Can the student do this? And we wanted to attach that at the at the question level almost. So that way we could actually say, okay, well, if the student has to do a reset, it's this area and this area specifically because it was these questions that the student got wrong. And um, because outcomes didn't work the way we wanted, that was the, the big issue. I almost wanted outcomes to work with... Um, with the activity tracking and and be tied in more with that. So the idea was ideally, if a student got, you know, eighty percent on the on the quiz, but they were missing questions on a particular topic, we could do a reset and just on that topic. That was the that was the idea and the proof of concept. And we thought, you know, obviously you could do this with outcomes, but by playing with outcomes, we found that there is no way that that actually came out. Uh, how could Gradebook improve? As a theme designer, I find it a nightmare. Um, yeah, it. I think the number one problem that I have with Gradebook is it is not intuitive at all. You you start to think, okay, well, obviously I go inside here, I do this, and I do that. It is. It becomes almost like a nightmare. And trying to find, I know that you should go back to the docs online. You should read the documentation. Everything I. I just found, I wish that there was a really intuitive way to get in there and know what you're doing is the right thing to do. And especially with, with um, outcomes. And in the end, we just had to ditch outcomes entirely. Uh, it, it's a beautiful thing, this, this Moodle, but uh, the gradebook area, it's always been this really fuzzy, hazy, am I doing this correctly? Uh, yes, um, so I think Michelle and Gareth here are talking about the, the idea of the, of the competency-based education and, and uh, 
Gareth makes the point, um, an assessment can never cover everything. And that's, that's one of the challenges as well. Trying to get an assessment that actually accurately measures the performance criteria. And yeah, it becomes one of these things of, are we, how much do we assess? And, and we've actually been told sometimes that we're over assessing. So it's, it's a real juggling act of trying the requirements. Yes, Moodle is a progression, so something for the Moodle user group, uh, perhaps something for the Moodle users association. Uh, in the past, I've thought some of these questions we should actually, at the Moodle Users Association, we should take up as a project. I've been reluctant to put in anything as a project, though, because um, if if you are if you get the votes, uh, you become the project manager <laughs> in that project. At least uh, that's the sort of the two-second explanation of the Moodle User Association. And um, yeah, that's the number one reason why I haven't put in anything. <laughs> oh yeah, the, the Moodle Users Association, yes, yeah. Okay, so we're talking the same thing, exactly. Yeah, I, in fact, I uh, one of the things that I thought about putting in for the first um, for the first uh, Moodle User Association for the vote was was uh, competency based education, and I'm glad I didn't because I would have looked like a bit of a fool because uh, th they were already working on it, and I I, I kind of knew that you have to do the research of actually looking at what they're working on and, and so forth, and I just never did that sort of. I know that as part of uh, putting in a proposal for the Moodle User Association, I would have come across, okay, it's already in the pipeline, but I'll have to think of something else for my wonderful Moodle User Association idea. I think we're still having a debate about um, some of the ideas behind what uh, competency-based education is. Um, oh no, this is actually regarding, if you do not know, and then you put in a proposal, it might have something that they do not think of. Okay, yeah, so yeah, getting back to the Moodle User Association, I suppose you're right. If I would have come up with my own sort of criteria, it would have been different perhaps than what they've actually built. Um, and it might might have been a good thing, uh, but yeah, I wasn't brave enough. <laughs> At least not the first round. <laughs> um, so yeah, some great uh, discussion about um, the various issues with competency based education, and and I think that it certainly is a lot different uh, for for my area where we're just talking about um, web design and so forth, as opposed to something like uh, the medical training. I, I have all the respect for for the issues that they have there because for for me, if a student slips through with a competent uh, when they're not, I mean, it's still a big deal, and I, I'd be upset if that happened. But it's not like um, okay, well, the student doesn't know CSS, and they've <laughs> they're out there building a website that doesn't use CSS properly. Not as big deal as somebody trying to take it somebody's appendix and they don't know how to do it properly. So. Um, well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I, I, uh, I appreciate a fantastic audience. And um, I don't know where you all are in the world, but this is kind of a weird time. Uh, Teresa and I were talking about that before uh, everybody came in, that this happens to fall in kind of a weird time zone for everybody around the world. So if you're in Asia, you're probably supposed to be asleep right now. And even Europe, you're probably supposed to be asleep right now. And uh, parts of America, maybe you're eating dinner. So I appreciate that you guys were here because I, I, I have the feeling that this was um, kind of an awkward time zone all around the world. <laughs> and the website looks bare. Yes, you're right. <laughs> Maybe somebody will be using the font tag and that would be bad. But <laughs> Okay, thanks again, Scott. And um, we've, got, we've got a wee 15 minute break there. So if you need to go and get a cuppa or um, bite to eat, you've got a bit of time there. So 
Thanks again. Your cup of water cold by now, Scott. <laughs> it is. I think I'm, I might have to go microwave it.